Lane, founder and CEO of Dylan Green. And today I have with me Nicole Steele, principal and co-founder of Insight Power Partners. Thanks for joining me, Nicole. Hi, Catherine. Good to see you. Can you introduce yourself and talk a bit about your background and how you came to take on the co-chair of Clean Energy for Biden? Oh, absolutely. You know, I spent about 15 plus, maybe 20 years in the clean energy environment, housing, affordable housing, political space. And so I've done everything from standing up programs for affordable housing agencies to running political campaigns to being the executive director of a regional nonprofit organization that installs solar and does workforce training. And so my current adventure is to really do just that and work on clean energy access and creating good clean energy jobs job and build healthy communities around that all with an equity lens. And so that's what I'm up to today. And the reason I got involved with Clean Energy for Biden when it was launched back in April of this year was because I realized that from my perspective, the number one most important thing that has to happen this year to benefit the climate and to push the clean energy industry forward is to get Joe Biden elected president. And so that is how I got engaged with CE4B. And it's an amazing network, 5,000 plus members and growing. And so we're, we're actively growing on growing that. And we can talk a little bit about that shortly with the goals of raising money for the campaign, really building a platform for the clean energy industry and getting out the vote and really showing how important this election is to the clean energy industry. No, absolutely. In 2020, 81% of Americans believe that the earth has been warming over the last hundred years. And nearly two thirds of Americans believe the federal government should act more aggressively to combat climate change. Do you think this will translate into votes for Biden given his strong climate platform? Well, from my perspective, I absolutely think so. And there was a really great New York Times article that came out about a week ago that really talked about where sort of voting blocks are and what the important issues are today and particularly in this election. And climate change came up as number two. So I really think that climate change is really becoming incredibly important across the board. So not just Democrats, but also Republicans are seeing the effects of climate change personally. And so they're in being impacted by natural disasters and really seeing that their like utility bills are going up because they're having to run their air conditioning longer, whatever it might be, but they're truly seeing personal impacts. And I think that's one reason why that voting block is growing exponentially. And then the other sort of element that I would say is Recently, you know, after Biden announced his climate plan and his clean energy jobs plan, there was this huge groundswell of activists supporting the Biden campaign. And so an element within the campaign called Climate Voters for Biden was created and is the second largest affinity group within the campaign today. And so CE4B, or Clean Energy for Biden, which is what I'm co-chairing, is coordinating directly with that, those climate voters for Biden, just behind women for Biden. And, and um, just as another sort of like key point is we had our, we do national phone banks on a, on a weekly basis. And we had our second one this past Tuesday. And um, we had uh, over 230 people registered to participate in that, in that phone bank where we called climate voters in Arizona. And um, we called over 1,500 individuals in just a 45 minute time frame. And, you know, we're going to be doing that moving forward. And it's really showing that, you know, people really highlight climate as sort of a top issue area. And then also the campaign sees us as a huge opportunity and sort of partner on this and that they see the value that CE4B has been able to bring to the table and really motivate the industry and really see opportunity for that industry to grow with the Biden administration. Very exciting. I love those stats. Um, I just want to switch gears slightly to COVID. <laughs> So how do you think Biden's approach to the COVID recovery will ensure growth of clean energy jobs while ensuring formal fossil fuel industry employees are not left behind? Yeah, so again, from my perspective and not speaking on behalf of the campaign, all of the climate and clean energy recommendations have that recovery lens. And I would say that even more specifically, the clean energy for Biden work 
has that recovery recommendation lens and that everything that we are sort of providing as recommendations to the campaign, either for day one actions or first 100 day actions or even a four year administrative plan is going to focus on good job and good jobs that result in an opportunity to join a union and having strong labor standards around the growth of the industry and then also job creation. And so, you know, growing huge segments of the industry um, so that there are jobs and then sort of knitting that together around what do job training programs look like, what do career pathway programs look like and entrepreneurship hubs look like, and then also pre-apprentice and apprenticeship programs so that we're not only providing good jobs, but also providing jobs in communities that maybe need that just transition. And so they, they're a former fossil fuel community and really needing to make sure that we're focused on communities that would be impacted by this, this new clean energy revolution. And then also in, in Biden's plan that was announced earlier this summer, he specifically called out frontline communities and that the frontline communities can be communities of color, it could be low income communities, it could be communities that are impacted by COVID, it could be communities that have been impacted by recent natural disasters or even natural disasters that we're still recovering from, right. that 40% of the dollars sort of allocated in the plan, well, it's, I mean, it's leveraged, so it's not like we're going to pay <laughs> $2 trillion, but it's a $2 trillion plan and 40% of those dollars are intended to go towards those frontline communities. And so that does include that COVID lens and really sort of building a much stronger economy as we start to um, recover from this, co this pandemic. Yeah, I'm really glad that you addressed that because one of my questions was around Biden's climate plan addressing racial and environmental justice. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think from a CE4B perspective, we have been incredibly intentional in building a diverse representation, the clean energy community, and then also, you know, how, what is our role in sort of bringing in other networks to diversify this movement? Right. And so we've been very intentional around who, who are co-chairs, who are sort of representing us on the leaderships, our executive committee, and then, you know, also highlighting topics around environmental justice, equity, building an equitable future, you know, sort of like black CEOs and like what are sort of opportunities there and what have been some of the challenges and how can we support more people of color in leadership roles and then also just highlighting sort of a diversity of voices. And so CE4B has been incredibly intentional around this sort of like bringing equity, inclusion and diversity into our lens. And I would say, honestly, that's how I got really involved as a co-chair and that I was on the, our first call and, you know, publicly highlighted how white and how male that call looked. And so, you know, right from the very beginning, we made that shift. And then I would say our coordination with the campaign, there's been recognition and it's really been made clear to us that bringing, make, making sure that people that have been doing work in the environmental justice space really do get a platform and really do have their voices heard as those as the plans are created. And so they there was a, a, a whole environmental justice roundtable that was created before his plan was announced this summer. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, we can always do better and we will continue to work on do work in this space. But I, I, I think the campaign is listening. And, and is definitely integrated sort of that frontline, low-income, community of color aspect into sort of his plans moving forward. Yeah.